The hardline approach to crime has been one of the hallmarks of the government's approach to criminal justice, with policy focusing on tougher sentences and ending early release for violent offenders. After 26 years of criminal practice at the bar, Chris Dorr QC, the author of the book, Justice on Trial, says a radical rethink of the criminal justice system is now long overdue. The criminal barrister says his research shows most of what the criminal justice system does is a total waste of time and actually makes crime worse. To discuss this further, Chris Orr joins us live from Bolton. Uh, Chris, thank you very much for joining us um, this afternoon. So you're calling for the justice system to be completely scrapped and reformed. Why exactly is that? Because we are doing everything wrong. We, we have been addicted to the use of prison as the first recourse whenever there's a public outcry about crime or including for young people. And we've doubled our prison population in the last generation. And all that's happened is we've seen a rise in drug use, uh, drug violence, gang violence. Uh, we have seen more and more deaths from overdose. Uh, we've seen more and more suicide and self-harm in the prison environment. But worst of all, we've seen more victims of, of murder and serious violence and sexual violence. And that's the absolute tragedy of what we do wrong. It is a bleak picture that you paint. Where do we start? Well, for my uh, part, I think the quickest win is to radically change the way we look at drugs and the prohibition of drugs. We, we've had drug prohibition in its current form for about 50 years, uh, and it's just led to a catastrophic rise in drug addiction, uh, gang violence and gang crime, and of course drug-related crime, because drug users have to take vast amounts of money from ordinary people through crime or they have to sell themselves and their bodies to get drugs on the black market and we need to have a complete overhaul of the drug system drug prohibition or rather alcohol prohibition was a dramatic failure in the united states and drug prohibition in england is an equally dramatic failure and it's something we need to scrap completely we need to have legal licensed and regulated drug supply so that drug users are treated like human beings and so that we wipe out organized crime gangs and we finally see an end to drug-related violence and death. There's also this um, debate about how the justice system disproportionately affects um, certain communities. Um, in your time as a barrister for a number of years, have you seen that play out in practice? Absolutely. There's no doubt. I mean, the statistics bear it out that you are infinitely more likely to be stopped and searched, to be arrested, to be prosecuted and to be imprisoned if you come from a black and minority ethnic community. Uh, and there are all sorts of reasons for that, but it's wrong because people from those communities are clearly not inherently more criminal. So why are they locked up at such a dramatically greater rate? Uh, and we need to ask ourselves those big questions. We need to be looking at why we're imprisoning and arresting so many young people, why so many young people are being criminalized from as young as 10. And I argue in the book that it should be 18. Why, why, why should you be criminalized at an age when you're not able to vote or participate in any other sort of social kind of activi activity or responsibility? It's, an, it's, it's ridiculous. Um, so you're absolutely right that the, the racial imbalance in the system is a travesty, but it's part of an overall complete failure of our system to really get to grips with crime. And that's what I'm arguing for in the book, completely radical change to our approach to prison, to drugs, and in particular to the way that we deal with young people. And, and those coming out of the care system in particular are treated, treated awfully within the care system, and then they're treated really disproportionately badly. They're 15 times more likely to go to prison just because they've been in care. So what are we doing wrong? How can that be the right thing to do with young people in our society? Many of us will say that these um, radical reforms, changes that you're calling for, is, is idealism. I mean, how do you change a system that's been put in place, that's embedded in our society, which has been put in place for a number of years? You, you, you change the system by using the lessons of what works and what fails. And I travel to the US in writing the book, and I deal extensively in the book with the failure of the US mass incarceration. They have 2.3 million people in prison, but off the scale levels of violent and uh, crime and homicide. Whereas you, I've also deal in the book with other much more humane societies like Norway and Switzerland, where they don't use imprisonment. They don't you know, demonize drug users and so on. And they have much, much lower levels of crime. So you have to learn from what works. You start with drugs because that can be done quickly. And then you radically, one by one, shut down every one of the failed Victorian prisons and old school prisons and you replace them with a system that actually works. That means most people are dealt with in the community and not in prison. And those who are in prison, your focus is on how are they going to be a law-abiding citizen when they come out. That's what matters. Nothing else matters.
Is there a cost associated with these chain changes? Because that could be a problem in itself. Are we, are we as a country, prepared to pay for these changes, these reforms? We're, we're paying for our failure now. The, the, the reforms I propose would save billions. And that's the best argument. There are two good arguments for the reforms I propose. One is there'll be less crime. So that means fewer people being murdered, raped, robbed and burgled. That's the absolute priority of our system. So that's a huge saving in and of itself, the human saving to victims of crime. But the savings in reducing the ridiculously over, over bloated prison population, for it's doubled from 40 something thousand to 80,000 in 20 years. If you follow my approach, we'd get it down to more like 20,000, something like that. So that would save billions. It would save billions if we were to remove law enforcement activity from the illegal drug market and all the people that get locked up and caught up in, 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 in drug offending and drug activity, all of that would disappear. So we would, we would halve our, our, our criminal justice budget, budget. The courts would actually be able to deal sensitively and properly with cases of serious sexual violence, murder and child abuse in a way that at the moment rape victims are waiting sometimes years to give evidence about being raped. That's wrong because we're clogging up the system with nonsense cases that should never be there. So there are huge cost savings and massive improvements to quality of life and massively improved outcomes for victims and for members of the public. You, you mentioned that as part, part of your research, you travel to the United States to see how things are, are done over there. Um, are there countries that you can look at to say, yeah, they're the ones that have got it right. They're the ones that here in the United Kingdom we should be following. Absolutely. And I, and I deal extensively in the book with some of the examples. One of them is the uh, prison system in Norway. Now, in Norway, they send very, very few people to prison. Only the really violent and dangerous individuals go to prison. But when they go there, they don't go to a prison with great big high walls and barbed wire and clanging gates and cells and bars and all the rest of it. They go to an environment that looks pretty much it's, it's secured on the outside perimeter, but inside it looks pretty much like an ordinary residential community. And, and the massive benefit of that is that when people come out, they don't blink in the sunlight and think, oh my God, I've got, you know, like English people who come out of prison, they come out of prison, you've got no idea what to do. No life, no home, no nothing. In Norway, they transition back into normal life and only 20% of those people who come out of Norwegian prisons commit another crime, as opposed to the 70 or 80% that come out of English prisons. And we need to learn from countries that have a civilised, pragmatic approach and much lower levels of crime. We live in a society where the legislature and the judiciary are separate, but it only seems like yesterday where you heard one party speaking about tough on crime, tough on the causes of crime. The Conservative Party always say that they're the party of law and order. There's got to be the political will here. Do you think that political will exists? Sadly, I'm not sure it does. And I think it's a real shame. And I, one of the reasons for writing the book and one of the reasons for speaking to your viewers is because I just want people to think before they immediately, we've heard it in the last few days, they reach for increased sentences. And we heard Pretty Patel talking about we want to make criminals, you know, quake with fear at the thought of being caught. That sort of language and that sort of mindset goes back thousands of years. And I talk about in the book about that, that historical eye for an eye mentality. It, the fact of the matter is, just as we don't anymore have slavery, we shouldn't anymore look at crime and punishment as something that is an Old Testament uh, way of thinking. And I just want people to reflect on the fact that when you treat people humanely, when you focus on rehabilitation, and when you make prisons as normal as possible, you get much less crime and many fewer victims. And, and I just hope that people can engage with that reality because the truth is the tough on crime approach, when it means long sentences, means more crime and more victims. And right the way through the book, and from the beginning of time, that's been the case. And I just hope that people will listen. I'm not, I'm not optimistic though, because sadly that message, the political message of getting tough and cracking down, it resonates with the public. But I'm just trying to appeal to people out there to accept and realize you might be tempted by it emotionally, but it fails your society and it fails you and it makes you more likely to be harmed or your family to be harmed. So please just have a think about it. Read the book and explore and you know, think about these things. Go to court, watch what happens. Get some insight rather than just listen to the sound bites. Crystal QC, fascinating talking to you. Really appreciate getting your thoughts this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you.